Okay, let's uh, begin the final lecture on labor search. So to pick up where we left off in the last class, we, um, we characterized the general stationary competitive equilibrium of the two-sided Diamond Mortensen Pizzariati's search model. We define that equilibrium as an object, W, U, J, and V. These are the value functions for matched workers, matched firms, an unemployed worker, and a firm that posts vacancy. A bargained real wage that satisfies this Nash bargaining condition, and a degree of labor market tightness, theta, defined as the number of vacancies divided by the number of unemployed. Um, and the final equilibrium condition is this zero profit condition, which says that the value of posting a vacancy must be equal to the value of the next best available economic activity, which is to do nothing for firm. No profits, no costs. Um, also, we, uh, you, you'll, hopefully you'll recall from the last lecture that we substituted out of the equilibrium conditions, these matching function terms M and expressed both the job finding rate Q. I'm sorry, that's the, I have this wrong here. This, be careful about this. So the job finding rate is defined as theta times Q. The vacancy filling rate or the job filling rate is defined as Q of theta. And that goes in this Bellman equation. So that was a mistake from the last lecture. The Bellman equation defined over unemployed workers as theta times Q of theta as the job finding rate. The Bellman equation for firms posting vacancies features the job filling rate or the vacancy filling rate defined as Q of theta. These six equations fully characterize the steady state equilibrium of these six endogenous objects. Now, here's what I wanna do for this final lecture. I want to prove, first of all, that there exists a unique real wage and a unique degree of labor market tightness that satisfies these equilibrium conditions. I'm going to do that by simplifying these six conditions down to two conditions, one of which I call a wage setting equation, the other that I'm going to call a zero profit condition. Those two equations will then characterize the equilibrium solution for the real wage and the degree of labor market tightness. I can analyze those two conditions after I've simplified these six down to those two in order to prove the existence and uniqueness of W and theta. Once I do that, I then want to spend the rest of the time doing some comparative static exercises to show how, in particular, increases in productivity, Y, increases in the unemployment benefit, B, and increases in the separation rate, delta, affect not only the real wage and the degree of labor market tightness, but also the amount of unemployment and the number of vacancies that are present in the model. That's the goal, and then we will be done. Okay, so how do we proceed? Let me first um, try to simplify these six equilibrium conditions down to two conditions. One of them is what I call the, the zero profit condition. How can I derive that? Well, First note that the value of posting a vacancy in equilibrium has to be zero. This implies then that if we plug zero for V back into the 
um, the Bellman equation for posting vacancies, then what do we get? We get R times zero is equal to negative kappa plus Q of theta times J minus zero. This means that the value of a match for a firm, J, is simply given by kappa divided by Q of theta, that is the vacancy filling rate. Once I have solved for J then, we can find the wage, what I call, I'm sorry, what I call the zero profit condition by substituting this value of J into the Bellman equation for a firm that is matched to a worker. So that Bellman equation reads R plus delta times J is equal to Y minus the wage plus the separation rate times the value of posting a vacancy. Well, that goes to zero. And we know that the value of a match for a firm is given by kappa over Q of theta. We therefore can derive what I call a zero profit condition, which expresses the real wage as a function of, among other things, the degree of labor market tightness. This is the zero profit condition. The two endogenous components in this model are W and theta, the rest of it is exogenous. What we want to do now is derive side by side with the zero profit condition, what's called a wage setting condition that also shows how the wage is related to the degree of labor market tightness. We'll then have two equations and two unknown variables where only the other parameters in the model are all exogenous. Let's go over here and derive what we call the wage setting condition or equation. How do we find this? Well, first what you want to do is start by writing down the Nash bargain condition, one minus alpha times W minus U is equal to alpha times J minus V. That is the starting point. Then recognize that the value of a match for a worker W can be derived from our first Bellman equation as the real wage plus the separation rate times the value of unemployment divided by the discount rate plus the separation rate. Is equal to alpha times J and the value of a match for a firm can be derived from the second of our four Bellman equations. And it looks like the following, output minus the real wage plus the separation rate times the value of posting a vacancy divided by the discount rate plus the separation rate minus the value of posting a vacancy. Now, of course, we already showed that capital V is going to be equal to zero. That's one of our equilibrium conditions. Therefore, one minus alpha times what is in brackets here, well, we can combine these terms 
and this is going to simplify to the real wage, let's see, minus RU over R plus delta is equal to alpha times Y minus W over R plus delta. And of course, the denominators here will cancel in this expression. And we will be left with then when we combine terms, the real wage will be equal to alpha y plus one minus alpha r u. Now we're not quite done yet. We wanna, we wanna be able to express the real wage as a function of the degree of labor market tightness. So this is alpha y plus one minus alpha and R times U, if you look up here in the third Bellman equation is given by the unemployment benefit plus the job finding rate theta times Q times W minus U. So that's the unemployment benefit plus theta times Q times W minus U. We can simplify this further. By recognizing that W minus U from the wage setting equation is simply equal to alpha divided by one minus alpha times J minus V. Of course, V is equal to zero and J is simply equal to kappa over Q of theta, which means that the real wage can simply be equal to alpha times Y plus one minus alpha times the unemployment benefit, plus, let's see, one minus alpha over one minus alpha, those are gonna cancel, and you're gonna be left with a theta, Q of theta, times an alpha, times J, which is kappa over Q of theta. The Q of theta terms will cancel, and you'll be left with an alpha, kappa, theta. This is the so-called wage setting equation. And you'll notice that it is expresses the wage as a linear function of the degree of labor market tightness theta. All of the other parameters in this equation are exogenous. The degree of bargaining power for workers, productivity, the unemployment benefit, and the cost of posting a vacancy. We now have two conditions and two unknown or endogenous variables, which can be solved for in principle for the values of the real wage and the degree of labor market tightness. Once we have found W and theta from these two equations, it is then straightforward to substitute these values back into our Bellman equations, back into the system in order to solve for capital W, capital U, capital J, and capital V. Now, of course, V, we already know, is equal to zero. So that one, we don't even have to find. We also know that J is equal to kappa over Q of theta. So once we know the value of theta from these two equations, we can instantly get the value of J. So that one is solved for. But what about the value of a match for a worker as well as the value of unemployment for a worker? Can we find reduced form conditions for those particular values? Well, we can, it's straightforward to do that. Again, go back to the Bellman equation for a matched worker and you will find that R plus Delta times the value of a match for a worker 
is equal to the real wage plus the separation rate times the value of unemployment for a worker. The Bellman equation for an unemployed worker is simply equal to R plus the job finding rate, that is theta times Q times the value of unemployment is equal to the unemployment benefit plus the job finding rate theta times Q plus the value of a match for a worker. Given known values of the real wage, as well as the degree of labor market tightness, we should be able to solve these two equations for capital W and capital U. Those are our two unknown variables. Well, how do we do that? Let's take R plus theta Q of theta times U and set that equal to B plus theta times Q times W. Well, W from the first equation is just the real wage plus the separation rate times U divided by R plus the separation rate. If I multiply both sides of this equation by R plus delta, you get the following. And then, if I, I, then I can easily solve this equation for the value of a match, I'm sorry, the value of unemployment for a worker, and you're going to get that it's equal to the discount rate plus the separation rate times the unemployment benefit plus the job finding rate times the real wage divided by R plus delta times R plus the job finding rate minus the job finding rate times the separation rate. a little bit of algebra and you can solve for the value of unemployment in terms of things we know. That is exogenous parameters, R, delta, B, and the endogenous variables that we've already solved for at an earlier stage, the real wage and the degree of labor market tightness. Of course, once we've obtained the value of unemployment, the value of a match for a worker is easily just equal to the real wage plus the separation rate times this large term, that's the value of unemployment, divided by the discount rate plus the separation rate. So all six endogenous objects then can be determined from our six equilibrium conditions. Now, one thing that we would like to do, um, and this will mirror our discussion or our presentation of the one-sided search model, is that we would like to add on to this two-sided search model um, um, equilibrium, steady state equilibrium conditions for the unemployment rate, as well as the number of vacancies. We're going to do this by appealing to the same lake pond model that we discussed in the one-sided search model. Right? And what was that lake pond model? Right? We had a lake which had the total pool of employed workers in our economy. And we had a smaller pond that included all of the fish who were unemployed. That is you. In this model, just like in the one sided search model, there are flows of these fish from the pond to the lake. And there are also flows of fish from the lake to the pond, right? So there are always some employed workers who are becoming unemployed and they become unemployed at rate delta. That is the exogenous separation rate um, in the model. And it's exactly the same as what we saw in the McCall model. 
The flows from, unemplo from in unemployment into employment, however, is, some, is a little bit different than the McCall model. Here, it's going to be equal to essentially the job finding rate, which was theta times Q of theta. That is the degree of labor market tightness times Q, which is defined as the job filling rate for firms. In a steady state equilibrium, the flows of people from unemployment into employment have to be equal to the flows of people from employment into unemployment, right? Now, what is the flow of people from unemployment into employment equal to? Well, that's the fraction of our population that is unemployed times the job finding rate, which was M of one comma theta. And that, of course, is just equal to unemployment times theta, Q of theta, as we've defined Q. So these are the flows of people from unemployment into employment, right? In other words, the fraction of everybody who's unemployed that finds a job tells us what this flow of people in the top part of this graph is. What is the flow of workers from employment into unemployment? Well, that's equal to the number of people who are working, one minus U, times the fraction or the probability that those workers become unemployed. In a steady state, these two flows have to balance, right? Meaning that U theta, Q of theta, has to be equal to one minus U times delta. If we solve this simple little equation for the unemployment rate, then we're going to find that it's equal to the separation rate divided by the separation rate plus the job finding rate, theta times Q. That's delta over delta plus the job finding rate. So obviously that is a positive fraction as theory would predict. Okay. And you'll see that this mirrors what the unemployment rate was in the McCall model. Remember in the McCall model, the unemployment rate was the separation rate divided by the separation rate plus one minus F of W star, where one minus F of W star is the probability of selecting a wage from the exogenous wage distribution that exceeds your reservation wage. That effectively is the job finding probability that you get over here in the two-sided search model. Now, since the degree of labor market tightness is defined as the number of vacancies divided by the unemployment rate, as soon as we found the unemployment rate, which depends on just exogenous features, as well as the degree of labor market tightness, we can solve for the number of vacancies in our model. Lowercase v is just equal to theta times u, which is just delta theta over delta plus theta q of theta. Right, so in theory, we could add these two conditions onto our six general equilibrium conditions and that would give us eight equations that characterize the solution for W, U, J, V, little w, theta, as well as little u and little v. So you've got eight variables with eight equations that characterize their equilibrium paths. Okay, so if we are going to be complete about our presentation here, I think it's important that we prove the existence and uniqueness of the real wage and the degree of labor market tightness. Even though we've, we've, we've derived these two equations, one is the wage setting equation, which again is equal to alpha times y plus one minus alpha times the unemployment benefit plus alpha kappa theta. 
And we've also derived this zero profit condition, which says that the real wage has to equal output minus R plus delta times kappa over Q of theta. Even though it makes sense that we should be able in principle to solve these two equations for, for these two unknown variables, I think it's important that we prove that in fact, a unique W theta combination actually satisfies these two in equilibrium. Okay, so let's, let's sketch a, a simple proof of that. First off, let's deal with the wave setting equation. I'm going to do this graphically, by the way. You'll notice first that, that W is continuous in theta. We can think of the real wage here as being a function of theta. First of all, it's continuous in theta. And, and we also see that W is increasing in theta, right? If we were to take the derivative of the real wage with respect to theta, it's equal to alpha times kappa, which is positive. So the wage setting equation is strictly increasing in theta at a constant rate, alpha times kappa. We also see that the real wage evaluated at a value of zero for the degree of labor market tightness would be equal to alpha y plus one minus alpha b plus alpha kappa times zero. So this is some positive value. In that sense, we should be able to, to form a graph of what the wage setting equation looks like, where I'm going to graph possible values of theta on the horizontal axis and then values of the real wage on the vertical axis. At a value of theta equal to zero, the real wage is alpha y plus one minus alpha B. We see that the real wage is strictly increasing in theta at a constant rate. In other words, it's linear. So it looks something like this. This is the wage setting equation where the slope of this line is alpha kappa. Now let's take the zero profit condition. Again, we see that the real wage as a function of theta is continuous in theta. At least for values of theta between zero and infinity. Now let's be clear about this. What is the limit as theta goes to zero of Q of theta. Remember, as the degree of labor market tightness becomes infinitely loose, that is the number of unemployed is huge relative to the number of vacancies, it is super easy for firms to be able to fill vacancies. So the vacancy filling rate Q goes to one. But as the degree of labor markets become infinitely tight, you have the opposite situation. It becomes impossible for the typical firm to fill a vacancy. So the vacancy filling rate goes to zero. Now, hopefully you'll also see that the real wage is actually strictly decreasing in theta for the zero profit condition. Now, how can I show that? Well, W prime is equal to what? That's going to be equal to, let's see, R plus delta or negative R plus delta times kappa over Q of theta squared times a negative one. So that's going to cancel with the first negative times Q prime of theta. What is the sign of this? Well, R plus delta is positive. Kappa over Q squared is positive. But what is the sign of Q prime? Well, 
we need to know what Q prime is in the first place, right? So Q of theta, hopefully you guys remember this, was equal to the matching function evaluated at one divided by theta comma one, where the first argument in the matching function is the unemployment rate. The second argument is the vacancy, number of vacancies. So what is Q prime of theta equal to then? Well, it's the derivative of the matching function with respect to the, num to the number of unemployed times chain rule, the derivative of one over theta with respect to theta. Well, that's negative one over theta squared. And that's it. There's no theta in the second argument. The M sub U is positive. Remember, the matching function is increasing in the number of unemployed. Negative one over theta squared is a negative, so Q prime of theta is negative. So W prime is a positive times a positive times a negative, making it a negative. So the zero profit condition is continuous and strictly decreasing in the degree of labor market tightness. Well, at a value of theta equal to zero, where Q of theta is equal to one, the real wage in the zero profit condition is just equal to Y minus R plus delta times kappa divided by Q of theta, which is just equal to one. The zero profit condition we've shown is strictly decreasing then in the degree of labor market tightness. It's not linear, it's gonna, it's gonna have some type of curvature to it. And let me call the value of theta that intersects a, the, the zero axis here where, where the real wage is equal to zero as theta bar. Now, coincidentally, I can characterize theta bar just to be complete about this, right? Theta bar is going to be the value of theta such that the real wage is equal to zero in the zero profit condition. So that is where zero is equal to y minus r plus delta times kappa over q of theta bar. If I want to characterize theta bar, then I simply recognize I can multiply both sides of this equation by Q of theta bar. And you get Q times Y is equal to R plus delta kappa. Therefore, Q of theta bar is equal to R plus delta kappa over Y. So if I want to solve for theta bar, you simply take the inverse function of Q and you evaluate it at R plus delta kappa divided by Y. So this is how you can actually characterize where the zero profit condition intersects the horizontal theta axis here. And it depends on the discount rate, the separation rate, the vacancy posting cost, as well as the productivity level Y. Okay, where the wage setting equation intersects the zero profit condition is of course going to determine the equilibrium degree of labor market tightness along with the equilibrium wage. Because the wage setting condition is strictly upward sloping and continuous, and because the zero profit condition is strictly downward, um, is strictly decreasing and continuous, there has to exist only a unique theta and W star that satisfy both the wage setting equation and the zero profit condition simultaneously, okay? So a unique steady state equilibrium exists. Now, this is important. If and only if, essentially I'm making an assumption here, right? And that is that a unique equilibrium, that is an intersection point exists only if the intercept for the wage setting equation is smaller 
than the intercept for the zero profit condition. What if instead the wage saving equation looked like this? Then there would be no intersection point at all, right? So there, there is an additional restriction or condition on this model that is required for the existence and uniqueness of theta and W. And that is that Y minus R plus Delta times Kappa has to be strictly greater than alpha Y plus one minus alpha times B. So that means that, let's see, one minus alpha times Y minus B has to be bigger than R plus Delta times Kappa. Or alternatively, we could write this as Kappa has to be less than one minus Alpha times Y minus B divided by R plus Delta. In other words, the cost of posting vacancies has to be sufficiently small in order for an equilibrium to exist. There's an upper bound on what Kappa can be in terms of the other parameters of the model. If the cost of posting a vacancy is so high, then firms that aren't matched are not going to want to even enter into the market and post a vacancy, in which case a wage won't be offered and there will eventually be no defined degree of labor market tightness. All right, so imposing the existence and uniqueness of the equilibrium in this two-sided search model requires that we impose some restrictions on the size of the vacancy posting cost. If this condition holds, then there will exist a unique W star and theta star. And hopefully that makes sense to you. All right, let's now spend the rest of the time doing some dirty comparative static work. I would like for us to determine how some of these endogenous concepts change when things like the productivity level changes or the degree of unemployment benefits or the separation rate suddenly change. In doing this, I would also like you guys to think about how the effects are similar or differ from the one-sided search model. So let me write down the key equations that we're going to work with here so that I don't have to flip back between the pages of notes that I've already written. The wage setting equation has the following form. The zero profit condition has this form. Here's the strategy that I'm going to use. Well, and I should also mention that because I'm going to be interested in the unemployment rate and the number of vacancies. The unemployment rate is delta over delta plus theta Q of theta. And V little v, I should say, is just delta theta over delta plus theta q of theta. Now, the strategy that I'm going to take here is that I'm going to, I'm going to take the wage setting equation and the zero profit condition, and I'm going to combine them and simplify them down to a single equation in terms of just the degree of labor market tightness so that I can execute comparative statics on that single equation and I don't have to use any matrix methods, all right? So if I set these two equations equal to each other, right? Because they're both equal to the wage, you get 
alpha y plus one minus alpha b plus alpha kappa theta is equal to y minus r plus delta kappa over q of theta. Therefore, one minus alpha times quantity y minus b should be equal to alpha kappa theta plus r plus delta times kappa over q. So now I have just one equation which combines the wage setting equation and the zero profit condition that expresses theta implicitly. So I'm going to use the implicit function theorem here. It expresses theta implicitly as a function of alpha, y, b, kappa, r, and delta. And what I want to do is compute, evaluate the partial derivative of theta with respect to some of these exogenous parameters y, b, and delta in particular. Although I would encourage you to compute all of the comparative statics on your own. Let's first consider an increase in productivity. So what happens when the productivity of a match rises exogenously? We can think of this as a productivity shock in the model. Well, let's take first the derivative of this expression with respect to y, recognizing that it appears in the equation explicitly as well as implicitly by way of theta. So the derivative of the left-hand side with respect to y is just one minus alpha. The derivative of the right-hand of the equation with respect to alpha would be, with respect to y, would be alpha kappa d theta dy, let's see, minus r plus delta kappa over q of theta squared times q prime of theta times d theta dy. So one minus alpha then would be equal to, by combining terms, alpha kappa minus r plus delta times kappa over q of theta squared times q prime quantity times d theta dy. Now, can we, now obviously then d theta dy is just one minus alpha divided by this whole term here, okay? But the question is, can we sign the value of this partial derivative? I think we can. One minus alpha is clearly a positive number because alpha is between zero and one. Alpha kappa is a positive number minus, let's see, r plus delta, that is positive, kappa over q squared, that is positive. q prime, now what is q prime equal to? Hopefully you recall on the last page that we derived what the derivative of q was with respect to theta, and it's equal to negative m sub u divided by theta squared. Right, it's the partial of the matching function with respect to unemployment divided by theta squared times a negative one, which is a negative. So this is a positive times a positive times a negative. So what is in curly brackets here then is a positive minus a negative, which makes the whole thing positive. Therefore, d theta dy is gonna be a positive divided by a positive, making it a positive. So increasing the productivity of a match will raise the degree of labor market tightness in this model. In other words, the number of vacancies in the model relative to the number of unemployed people in the economy is going to go up. That makes sense, hopefully. 
as the productivity of a match rises, firms are going to be encouraged to want to post more vacancies. But at the same time, I imagine the economy's unemployment rate is going to shrink. So the, the ratio of V to U is probably going to go up. Labor markets are going to become tighter. And since labor markets become tighter, that tells me that it's, that it's likely that the real wage, the bargained real wage is going to go up. Remember, as labor markets become tighter, workers command more of the bargaining power relative to firms because the job finding rate goes up, but the job filling rate goes down. Can we show that mathematically? Sure. What's the partial of W with respect to Y? Well, we can simply go back up and evaluate the partial of W with respect to Y using either of our two equations here. I'm going to choose to work with the wage setting equation. So this would be alpha plus alpha kappa times d theta dy. Well, d theta dy we already showed is positive. So this is a positive plus a positive, meaning it's positive. So as expected, the wage and the degree of labor market tightness both increase as a result of higher productivity. If we want to look at that graphically, we can do so by using the same graphical device that we did on the previous page. Remember, the wage setting equation looks like the following. The slope is alpha kappa, and the intercept is alpha y plus 1 minus alpha b. The zero profit condition looks like this. Okay, where the intercept is y minus r plus delta kappa. The intersection of the zero profit condition and the wage setting equation tells us the equilibrium degree of labor market tightness and the equilibrium real wage. Now, what happens if there's an exogenous increase in y? Well, Obviously, the slope of the wage setting condition doesn't change. That's just alpha kappa, but the intercept increases. It increases by alpha. So the wage setting equation shifts up. Well, what happens to the zero profit condition? It also increases because y appears in the intercept here. And one can also show that it also increases the value of theta bar such that the wage is equal to zero in the zero profit condition. Now it turns out that the shift in the zero profit condition is going to be enough relative to the shift in the wage setting equation to actually increase the degree of labor market tightness, as well as the real wage. Now be careful about that. You'll notice here that if, for instance, the wage setting equation shifted by a lot, but the zero profit condition didn't shift by very much, the wage would rise, but the degree of labor market tightness would fall. But we know that labor market tightness must increase. We prove that mathematically. So that means the shift in the zero profit condition must be of a bigger magnitude than the shift in the wage setting equation. That's the only way you're going to get higher labor market tightness as well as a higher equilibrium wage. Now, just to be crystal clear about this, remember theta bar was defined as the inverse function of Q evaluated at R plus delta times kappa over y. If I want to, and, and so theta bar in some sense is a function of y. If I want to compute the derivative of theta bar with respect to y, that is prove that the intercept term here increases, I can evaluate this derivative. 
You might recall from your calculus class that the derivative of the inverse function is one divided by the derivative of the regular function evaluated at theta. But I have to apply the chain rule because the argument that I'm evaluating at the inverse function of Q at depends on Y itself. And so the derivative of the inside here with respect to Y is negative R plus delta kappa over Y squared. Well, Q prime is negative, right? Remember, it's just negative in U, M sub U over theta squared. So one over Q prime is negative. And a negative R plus delta kappa over Y squared is also negative. So the whole thing is positive. So theta bar is going to, that, that is the intercept term here is going to increase. So this zero profit condition shifts out both up the W axis as well as up the theta axis. And it shifts out far enough to ensure that labor market tightness increases as well as the real wage. What about the unemployment rate? How do you think the unemployment rate is impacted by higher productivity? Well, we simply go back up to the solution for the unemployment rate, which depends on theta to determine what that partial derivative is. To evaluate that partial derivative, I'm just going to use the product rule. No, excuse me. I'm going to, it's, it would be what? Negative delta over the denominator squared. So that's delta plus theta Q of theta quantity squared times the derivative of the denominator with respect to Y. Well, that's going to appear in theta as well as in Q of theta. So it would be, here we have to do the chain rule, right? It would be Q of theta plus theta Q prime of theta, all of that times D theta DY. All right, what's the sign of this? Well, negative delta over delta plus the job finding rate squared is obviously going to be a negative. D theta DY we've already determined is positive. What's the sign of this term? Okay, here's where you have to employ some tricks, I suppose. What is Q of theta? That is the vacancy filling rate. In terms of the matching function, that is M of one over theta comma one, plus theta times Q prime, which was minus M sub U over theta squared. So what is that equal to? Well, that's M of one over theta comma one minus, let's see, one of these thetas cancels. So you're left with a minus MU over theta. Well, let me factor out a one over theta from this expression, recognizing that M has constant returns to scale. So this is one over theta times if I factor out a one over theta from M, you're left with M of one comma theta, right? Because the, the matching function M has constant returns to scale and then minus the derivative of M with respect to U. Well, now we're getting closer because we can actually simplify this expression again by making use of the fact that the matching function is linearly homogeneous. Remember, one property of, of linearly homogeneous functions is this so-called Euler's theorem, which says that the partial derivative of the function evaluated, or I'm sorry, times the first argument 
where the partial derivative is evaluated with respect to the first argument, plus the partial derivative of M with respect to its second argument times its second argument. So MU times U plus MV times V is equal to M in exactly the same way that the production function F is equal to F sub K times K plus F sub L times L. Now, if we divide through this equation by U, you get M of one comma V divided by U, which is the degree of labor market tightness. We're left with M sub U plus M sub V times V over U, which is the degree of labor market tightness. So what is M of one comma theta minus MU, M sub U equal to? It's equal to theta times M sub V. So this term here becomes one over theta times M of one comma theta minus MU is just theta M V cancel, cancel, the whole thing is equal to the de partial derivative of the matching function with respect to the number of vacancies, which we know is strictly greater than zero. So this complicated term here, Q plus theta Q prime is nothing more than the partial derivative of M with respect to the number of vacancies, which is positive. So du dy is a negative times a positive times a positive, which means that du dy is strictly less than zero, as is expected. When the productivity of a match becomes higher, vacancies go up and unemployment falls. And therefore, the degree of labor market tightness goes up. Now, can we prove mathematically that the number of vacancies actually goes up? That is, can we evaluate dv dy? We can. The derivative is a little bit messy, but it is totally doable, right? Remember, vacancies is just delta theta over delta plus the job finding rate. So if we evaluate that partial derivative with respect to y, you're going to get delta over delta plus theta q. Here I'm employing the times d theta dy minus, I'm employing the product rule. Let's see, delta theta over delta plus theta q squared times the derivative of the denominator with respect to y. So that's q plus theta q prime times d theta dy. Well, this looks messy, but fortunately we know what a lot of this stuff is. Um, we can group these terms. Uh, let's see here. Let me factor out of this um, expression here a delta times a partial of theta with respect to y. So this delta times the partial of theta with respect to y, I'm going to pull out of the expression. And then I'm going to combine what's left by recognizing that I need to multiply both the numerator and the denominator of this first term by delta plus theta q. So it would be a delta plus theta q minus what's in the, what's in the numerator over here. Well, it's a theta times this thing in squirrely brackets, where this thing in brackets we determined on the last page is just the partial of m with respect to the number of vacancies. So this is minus theta times m sub v divided by delta plus theta q of theta quantity squared. Well, this is going to be the separation rate plus the job finding rate 
you'll recall is just m of one comma theta minus theta m v divided by delta plus theta q of theta squared times delta d theta dy. Now this is useful because hopefully you recognize what this is equal to. m of 1 comma theta minus theta mv m of 1 comma theta minus theta mv is just equal to the derivative of m with respect to u. So this becomes the separation rate plus the partial of the matching function with respect to the number of unemployed divided by delta plus theta q of theta squared times the separation rate plus d theta dy. Delta plus m of u, m sub u is positive over a squared term, that's positive, times the separation rate, that's positive, times d theta dy, which we already showed was positive. So you get a positive number. So the number of unemployed fall as a result of higher productivity the number of vacancies increase as a result of higher productivity, which makes the degree of labor market tightness then increase as V rises and U falls. And as labor markets become tighter, that enables workers to negotiate for higher wages. So the real wage goes up. And we showed all of that mathematically as well as using our graphical tool. What if there's an increase in the unemployment benefit? How does that affect the degree of labor market tightness, the real wage, the unemployment rate, and the number of vacancies? Well, let's use the same analysis. Let me take the derivative of this equation which I derive by combining the wage setting equation and the zero profit condition together with respect to not Y, but B. Hopefully you are going to see that this is going to have exactly the opposite impact on the degree of labor market tightness as an increase in Y, because B enters this equation essentially isomorphically to, uh, to Y except in the opposite sign. So it looks to me like all of the key comparative statics should be the exact opposite, but in the same quantity or magnitude as the partial derivatives with respect to Y. So the derivative then of the left-hand side with respect to B would be equal to negative one minus alpha the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to B would simply be equal to alpha kappa d theta dB minus R plus delta kappa over Q squared times Q prime d theta db. Combining terms, we get alpha kappa minus r plus delta kappa over q squared times q prime quantity d theta db is equal to negative one minus alpha. Well, that is the exact same expression for dy, I'm sorry, d theta dy, 
except there is a positive term over here instead of a negative term. This implies then that d theta dB is just equal to the negative of d theta dy. And so as the unemployment benefit rises, the degree of labor market tightness is going to shrink. Labor markets are going to become looser. That is the number of vacancies relative to the number of unemployed is gonna fall. This suggests that more of the bargaining power in the Nash agreement is going to fall to firms, which should put downward pressure on the real wage. Let's see if that we can get that. What's the partial of W with respect to the unemployment benefit? Well, to evaluate that, let's just go to the wage setting equation here and take the partial of, of both sides of this equation with respect to B. And we get dw db is equal to one minus alpha plus alpha kappa times d theta db. Well, because d theta db is just the negative of d theta dy, this is going to be equal to one minus alpha minus alpha kappa d theta dy. which is just one minus quantity alpha plus alpha kappa d theta dy. And what is alpha plus alpha kappa d theta dy? That's just dw dy. So dw db is nothing more than one minus dw dy which has to be positive because the partial of W with respect to Y is going to be a positive fraction. Think about it. If the productivity of a match increases by a dollar, that additional dollar of surplus is going to be split between the worker and the firm in some way. If alpha is equal to one half, then 50 cents will go to the worker in, the ter in terms of higher wages and 50 cents will go to the firm in terms of higher profits. So dw dy is gonna be positive, but less than one. It's a positive fraction, which means that dw db is also gonna be a positive fraction. So contrary to what I just said a minute ago, I was wrong about something. The degree of labor market tightness is indeed going to go down, however, the real wage is not going to go down, it's going to go up. When the degree of labor market tightness shrinks, that gives firms more power in the Nash bargain, which should put downward pressure on wages. However, if the unemployment benefit goes up, then the cost of searching for work is, is going to go down, right? In other words, the lowest reservation wage possible that workers are willing to accept rather than just be unemployed is going to go up just like we saw in the one-sided search model. That effect is going to have, that, that, that dynamic is going to push the equilibrium wage up. That effect must be dominating the downward effect that lower labor market tightness has on the wage bargain. So all else equal, higher unemployment benefits should push up equilibrium wages. And it's the incentive effect which is dominating here for workers. Now unemployment is actually more valuable since the unemployment benefit goes up. And so the way the minimum wage that workers are willing to accept to work as opposed to simply searching for a job in the next period is going to be higher. That bargaining set, the fact that it is the lower bound on that bargaining set is being pushed higher, causes the equilibrium wage to rise, it appears. If I were to draw this graphically, what would be going on? So here's theta, here's W. Here's the wage setting equation. 
here is the zero profit condition. The wage setting equation has a slope of alpha kappa and an intercept of alpha y plus one minus alpha times b. The intercept of the zero profit condition is y minus r plus delta kappa. As you can see, a higher unemployment benefit is going to push up the wage setting equation. But it has no effect on theta bar or the vertical intercept on the zero profit condition. The unemployment benefit doesn't appear in this intercept or in this intercept. So the zero profit condition is completely unaffected by a change in the unemployment benefit. This will unambiguously reduce the degree of labor market tightness as we showed mathematically and will unambiguously increase the equilibrium wage as we just showed graphically. Huh. So we could have gotten the same result just graphically prior to doing the comparative statics. And that would have probably made more sense. How does the unemployment rate affected by a higher unemployment benefit? My sense is that this should increase the unemployment rate as it lowers the, deg the degree of labor market tightness and, in, and, in, and effectively encourages people to, or makes unemployment in some sense less costly, it should also raise the unemployment rate. Well, can we find that mathematically? Sure, let's evaluate the, the partial of U with respect to the unemployment benefit. That's going to be equal to, let's see, negative delta over delta plus theta Q squared times the derivative of the denominator with respect to B, which would be Q plus theta Q prime times D theta db. Again, d theta db is just equal to the negative of d theta dy. So this becomes delta over delta plus theta q squared times q plus theta q prime times d theta dy. Well, hopefully you can see from the previous analysis that that's just equal to the negative then of du dy. That's the same term except with a negative attached to the whole thing. So this thing simply is equal to the opposite of the partial of u with respect to y, which is positive. So du db I'm sorry, which is which is negative. I'm getting confused now. So du dy was negative, right? And so negative times a negative is going to be positive. So as expected then, the partial of U with respect to the unemployment benefit is positive. Making unemployment benefits more generous is going to increase the economy's unemployment rate. And how does it do that? It increases the unemployment rate because it has no effect on the separation rate, but it's going to shrink the job finding rate. Theta times Q is going to get smaller 
as the unemployment benefit rises. And therefore, the flows from unemployment into employment are going to shrink, which is going to raise the unemployment pond and therefore shrink the employment lake. I'm not going to do this comparative static. I'm going to allow you guys to do this one on your own, but hopefully you will be able to find, because it's perfectly symmetric, that the partial of the number of vacancies with respect to the unemployment benefit is just the exact opposite of the partial of V with respect to Y. Now, the number of vacancies that firms are posting as the match becomes more productive goes up. So a positive times a negative is a negative. So here, as unemployment benefits increase, firms are posting fewer vacancies. The number of unemployed workers goes up, and therefore the degree of labor market tightness, V over U, is going to go down as we showed in our graph. Now, in each of these cases, you'll notice that d theta db is just negative d theta dy. dw db is just 1 minus dw dy. du db is just the negative of du dy, and dv db is just the negative of dv dy. And it's because the unemployment benefit and the productivity of the match more or less enter the model in a symmetric way. And so three out of the four comparative statics are just the exact opposite. The only one that is different, of course, is the wage. And it goes up for reasons discussed earlier. I've taken far too long here, but let me just go ahead and kind of quickly illustrate what happens if there is an increase in the separation rate. What happens to labor market tightness, the real wage, unemployment, as well as the number of vacancies when the separation rate increases? Let's employ this. Actually, let's, uh, let's, let's look at this graphically first to build intuition. What does our intuition tell us? Here's the wage setting equation. Here's the zero profit condition. With intercepts alpha y plus one minus alpha b and an intercept y minus r plus delta kappa. A higher separation rate looks to me like it's going to shift down the zero profit condition. It will not affect the wage setting equation. That intercept does not change. And so this looks to me like it's going to lower the degree of labor market tightness and lower the equilibrium real wage. Now, just to be clear, again, theta bar is defined as Q inverse R plus delta kappa over Y. So the derivative of theta bar with respect to delta is 1 over Q prime times kappa over Y. Q prime, you'll recall, is negative. That's m sub u divided by theta squared times a negative one. So that's a negative times kappa over y is a positive. So theta bar is, in de is decreasing in delta. So both intercepts shift in on the zero profit condition, thereby lowering the degree of labor market tightness and also lowering the real wage. But again, we can show this mathematically by appealing to the implicit function theorem, right? Let's take the derivative then of our 
equation, which combines the wage setting equation and the zero profit condition, this time with respect to delta. And what do we get? The derivative of the left-hand side is zero. The derivative of the right-hand side is alpha kappa d theta d delta plus kappa over q minus r plus delta kappa over q squared times q prime times d theta d delta. If we combine terms, we get alpha kappa minus R plus delta kappa over Q squared times Q prime. All of that times D theta D delta is going to be equal to negative kappa over Q of theta. Well, alpha kappa is a positive minus R plus delta is positive. Kappa over Q squared is positive and Q prime is negative. So it's a positive minus a negative gives you a positive. And on the right hand side, we have a negative Kappa over Q. So that is a negative. So that means that D theta D delta is negative, just as we showed in our graph. Now, what about the derivative of the wage with respect to the separation rate? I'm going to compute that directly from the wage setting equation. So it would be alpha kappa times d theta d delta. Positive times a negative is a negative. So the wage is decreasing in the separation rate, just like we've shown graphically. So the degree of labor market tightness falls, but the real wage also falls. What about the unemployment rate? What's the partial of U with respect to the separation rate? Again, just go back to our reduced form solution for the unemployment rate and take the derivative of this thing with respect to the separation rate. It's a little complicated because you've got deltas here, here, and also inside of theta. But if you do the calculus carefully, you're going to find that it's equal to 1 over delta plus theta q minus delta over delta plus theta q squared times the derivative of the denominator with respect to delta. Well, that's one plus quantity Q plus theta Q prime times D theta D delta. Now, if I combine these two terms by creating a common denominator, that is multiplying the first term by delta plus the job separation rate. I'm sorry, delta plus the job finding rate over delta plus the job finding rate. You get the following. Delta plus theta Q. Let's see, minus delta. Minus delta times Q plus theta Q prime times d theta d delta divided by delta plus theta q squared. Some of this cancels. And you're left with theta q, which is the job finding rate, m of 1 comma theta minus delta times this thing in brackets here, which hopefully you remember on the last page or the one before that, this term was equal to the derivative of the matching function 
with respect to the number of vacancies, M sub V. We derive that by appealing to the fact that M has constant returns to scale times the partial of theta with respect to delta divided by delta plus theta Q squared. Now, can we sign this? M is of course positive. There are a positive number of matches every period. Minus delta, that's positive. M sub V, that's positive. D theta D delta is negative. So it's a minus a negative. So it's a positive minus a negative, which is a positive, divided by a squared term that is a positive, which makes the whole thing greater than zero. So the unemployment rate, of course, increases if there is a higher separation rate. And of course, that makes sense from our lake pond model. If the separation rate rises, the flow of people from employment into unemployment is going to increase and it will be large enough to offset any potential decrease in the job finding rate. So the unemployed pond is going to get bigger. By the way, this contrasts with the result. Hopefully you remember this. This result here contrasts with the result that we found in the McCall one-sided search model. Go back and take a look at that partial derivative and you will see that the unemployment rate um, is ambiguous with respect to the separation rate, right? And the reason being is that the flow of workers into from employment to unemployment increases but at the same time, I believe what we showed was that the flow of workers from unemployment into employment also increases because it lowers your reservation weight. Those two effects are offsetting to one another, but we don't know their relative magnitudes. And so in the one-sided search model, this partial derivative was ambiguous. In the two-sided search model, we see that it is strictly greater than zero that the flows into unemployment are bigger unambiguously than any potential flows out of unemployment into employment. Last one, and then we will call it a semester. The partial of V with respect to the separation rate. This one, unfortunately, will be ambiguous. If we carefully take the derivatives here, you're going to find that it should be equal to theta plus delta times d theta d delta. I'm using the product rule in both the numerator and the denominator. Minus delta theta over delta plus the job finding rate squared times the derivative of the denominator with respect to delta. One plus q of theta plus theta q prime of theta quantity d theta d delta. Now, again, if I attempt to combine terms here by creating a common denominator, this becomes theta delta plus theta squared Q. Plus delta squared D theta D delta plus theta Q. d theta, d delta. Actually, I think I'm missing a delta here. So theta, delta, 
plus theta squared Q plus delta squared d theta d delta plus delta theta Q d theta d delta minus delta theta minus delta theta times Q plus theta Q prime quantity d theta d delta that whole term divided by delta plus theta Q squared. Some of this looks like it simplifies. Here's a theta delta, here's a negative theta delta. Um, Theta squared Q is the same as theta times theta Q. And theta Q, hopefully you remember from a previous page, is the derivative of M with respect to U plus theta times the derivative of M with respect to V. Plus, let's see, delta squared D theta d delta plus again we have a delta theta q so that would be a delta times m sub u plus theta m sub v times d theta d delta minus delta theta times Q plus theta Q prime, and that was equal to the derivative of M with respect to V times D theta D delta. All of that divided by delta plus theta Q squared. Now, m sub u plus theta m sub v, the partial derivatives are positive. Theta is positive, so this thing here is positive, plus delta squared times d theta dd. Well, labor market tightness shrinks with higher separation rates, so that is a plus a positive times a negative. That's a negative. Plus Delta times a positive times d theta dd, d delta is negative. So that's plus a negative minus positive times a positive times a positive times a negative. Positive, 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 negative is minus a negative. So it's a positive plus a negative plus another negative minus a positive. Well, that's a positive plus a negative over a positive. And so the whole thing is really ambiguous. We cannot determine, I don't think, unless somebody sees a trick there to sign that um, in a way that is ambiguous. It's unclear to me whether or not firms are going to post more vacancies if the separation rate increases. Here's the problem. If the separation rate increases, that in, in some sense lowers the value of a match for both worker and firm. And so firms are going to want to are going to be incentivized to post fewer vacancies since the value of a match goes down. However, higher separation rates also lower the real wage. And as the real wage goes down, that lowers firms' costs, which increases the value of a match, because the value of match depends on the difference between output and the real wage over time.
So because it depresses the real wage, it actually increases the value of the match for a firm in that way. I think those two forces are offsetting one another and it's unclear which of the two is stronger. So higher separation rates both lower and increase the value of a match for a firm. It lowers the value of a match directly by increasing the rate at which workers are exogenously separated from the firm, but it increases the value of the match indirectly by also lowering the real wage that firms have to pay. So the effect is ambiguous. Although the effect on the wage is unambiguously negative, the effect on the degree of labor market tightness is unambiguously negative, and the effect on the unemployment rate is unambiguously positive. So that's my discussion of the compare statics. It took a bit longer than I wanted to. I think in this two-sided search model, the derivatives and the signing of these derivatives are a little bit more challenging than the one-sided model, but you sh still should be able to execute it. And I would also definitely encourage you to graph it ahead of time to try to understand the intuition. The way these things work in this model typically is that you want to think about how the, the, the exogenous change impacts the degree of labor market tightness. Does it tend to push up or push down the number of vacancies that firms want to post relative to the unemployment rate? That's going to help us think about what's going to happen then to the real wage as well. And you can see that graphically by whether or not the wage setting equation and or the zero profit condition shift. So that concludes my discussion then of the Diamond Mortensen Pizzariati search model.